Okay. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Brian Bogard. I work in the Technology Transfer Office at NASA's Armstrong Flight Research Center uh, down here in Southern California. And today I'll be your host for this NASA Technology Transfer Program webinar on our fiber optic sensing system technology. Um, our presenter today is Dr. Hanman Patrick Chan. Uh, Dr. Chan graduated from the University of California, Irvine in 2008 with a PhD in Interdisciplinary Materials Science and Engineering. Uh, he joined NASA's Armstrong Flight Research Center in 2009, where he has been working on the fiber optics sensing system, uh, which is based on the fiber brag gratings. Uh, his work includes improving various aspects of this technology uh, for widespread deployment in terms of uh, non-destructive structural health monitoring, which includes strain, temperature, pressure, and cryogenics liquid level. He has published numerous papers in journal publications related to this technology, and he has presented his research at uh, numerous technical conferences as well. Um, following Dr. Chan's presentation, I will be giving a short presentation on how uh, NASA licenses technologies to outside organizations. And also, before we get started, I will note that uh, everyone's microphone has been muted, but if you have any questions, feel free to type them in uh, to the chat box on the lower right-hand side of the screen, and we'll answer them after uh, Dr. Chan's presentation. Uh, so at this point, I will turn it over to you. Okay, good. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, Brian, for the demonstrations. And um, all right, so um, this talk is talking about uh, FOSS at uh, NASA Armstrong, and it's an overview. Um, the table of content is um, for, for, for those that uninitiated uh, in terms of um, uh, um, destructive um, uh, sensing. So what is a sensor? A type of aerospace sensor that we deal with a lot with resistive strain gauge, uh, thermal couple, and RTDs, uh, resistive thermal uh, detectors. Um, so, and, and then we'll talk about how those works, and then the fiber based sensor, how those work, uh, specifically fiber rack gratings. And I'll go over the introduction of two types of um, fiber optic based interrogator that, that used to uh, monitor these type of um, sensors. Um, uh, WDM and OFDL, this is what uh, Armstrong's uh, FOSS is this based on. And then I would go over the, the advantage, why or on what instance you would use this uh, OFDL technology. And, and then uh, a brief introduction of, of all the projects that, that we have been working on in internally to, to NASA. And then uh, hopefully I can open up the floor and then answer some of your questions. Um, so, so that's just a basic uh, uh, slide deck. What is a sensor? A sensor we define as any device that can detect environmental changes and report the output to the end user. So type of sensing, you, you can do like force, you can do pressure, you can see how fast the, the, the plane goes in, in terms of acceleration, pitch, yawn, um, temperature, it's, 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 it's your, if it's your material subject to, to really hot or really cold temperature. So we need all these sensors, um, in order to relay the information, make sure that your, your structure is in optical condition, you know, your, your device on the test is under optical condition. So why do we need these sensors? Where do we find them? We actually carry a bunch of sensors at, at, um, at all times. And, you know your latest iPhone. You have you know the the ambient light sensor. You have a touch screen. You have a proximity sensor. So so when you listen to call, you turn off the 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 touch screen. Um, fingerprint sensor. Now you have Face ID. They, they blast IR light all over your face to 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 I to to identify your face and then uh, detector to 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 see the back reflection of of all these um. Face ID. So, so there's even you know a typical phone has a bunch of sensors. So, so our rationale is for 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 aerospace structure, we should have all this information related back, so that the the operator will will have a uh 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 know the the current health of your of your of your structure, be it a, a airplane or, or or a rocket or 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 space um, satellite. So um, these couple of slides talk about how traditional uh, uh, resistive uh, gauge works. Um, so, so this is uh, one of the uh, thin film strain gauge. How it works is basically uh, a change of uh, resistance 
over the the initial resistance and and then the gauge factor. So 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 it's basically a a, a small resistance. Then and then if you if you bend on it, then you have either tension and compression and then compress the, the metallic and then you you have a different uh, uh the different resistance and then you you generate a voltage change. And this voltage change is usually measured in, in some sort of bridge zone bridge setup. So you 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 at least you need you measure the, the voltage difference and then the V in, V out with the with the with the device under test as your resistance and then you 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 measure your um strain that way. And there is a various uh precise strain gauge setup. These strain gauge has been has been used since the the, the 1940s. So so it's 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 um uh, it's tried and, and true in aerospace environment, we would argue. And the next type of um, sensor that we typically see in terms of uh, aerospace temperature. So we usually use um, thermocouples. These are two different types of metal joined together. Usually we see a type K thermocouple, and then they have these, it, it, with the two type of material joined together, then you, you, if you put a voltage difference there, that, that you, you create a pulsar effect, and then by, by measuring the voltage potential difference, you would be able to 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 measure the temperature. Um, same same principle um, apply for a resistive um, the uh, RTD, and you would have different material, and then you have the 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 resistance of of the material that caused the voltage change, and then you you will monitor that, and then it it. Uh, for a precise uh, LTD, you also need four wires to 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 uh, sustain uh, uh, a known current, and then two two wire to measure the voltage different across the LTD. So so given all these rich rich setup, you know one sensor, you at least you need four wires. So so this is kind of uh, and and then type of point sensor and the accuracy. So. So a thermocouple is two wire for um, the accuracy for for under cryogenic structure is around plus or minus two degrees Kelvin, and then our LTD is a uh, uh, four wires prefer and um, plus or minus one point three Kelvin. It's uncalibrated, and then the just talk about the pros and the cons on, on resistive strain gauge or LTD. I mean the advantage is industry proven. It's been, it's been, uh, if you just want a device to, to have a point sensor, you just want to know the, either the strain or the temperature at, at one location, these are perfectly good way to, to apply them because it's, it's, it's easy, it's proven, and you can have a high sample rate. Um, the disadvantage of each of these uh, sensor has a unique gauge factor, and then you have to calibrate in terms of the voltage, the cable. Um, no multiplexing, so you have to add a lot of cable if you want to add more than five. Then, then, and in another case, is um these these because these are based on a constant current, so it's accessible to EMI. If if you you have a you have an environment that would generate a lot of EMI, perhaps it's a electric airplane. Then 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 that these because you have bun, bundles of cable that would generate a lot of EMI and um, and installation time. It takes it it takes a long time for in for for a skilled technician to 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 kind of apply these um, strain gauge onto the airfoil structure, and um, so so these are the pros and cons and current technology. And the next slide is kind of talk about the the difference between the the fiber optic system. A fiber sensor versus traditional strain gauge, and and we like to say one of these things is not like the other. So um, so the first picture is showing um, we, we have a coupon here with uh with uh twenty one type of strain gauges with the cable bundle. You can see the cable bundle, and then the the fiber optics with six hundred twenty eight Kobe um uh, cascade um fiber back grading lay around the same section areas uh, within this coupon. So 
So you can al already see that if you use a lot of string gauge, it, it will become really heavy. And then the second one is if you want to do a rosette, which means that the string gauge, you, you can buy this string gauge with zero degrees, 45 degrees and nine degrees in order to, to measure the, the, the wing deflection that is, is big. Now you have nine wires. And if you want to organize these string gauge with, if you want to instrument a hundred string gauge and a hundred thermal couple onto your, on, onto, onto your ground testing or, um, or, or flight testing, that's, this is, is, is going to be super hard to, to, to wire this cable and make sure that, um, it's all calibrated correctly. And we like to say the fiber is, is light and easy and it's small. And now we just talk about uh, um, what, so what has to uh, a sensor onto the fiber? Um, these are called fiber brad gratings. It, it's, it's using a, a typical telecon single mode fiber at 1550. And we, we actually have method to, to write inside the, the, the glass to, to have the in, uh, index of reflection changes so that you have a, you 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 have a, a periodicity of the core reflective index of different um, index of reflection, so that only one wavelength is being um, reflected. This wavelength you can you can think about as a, a constant frequency. And what will happen if you if you cause these type of perturbation in 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 terms of compression or in terms of uh, expansion, the reflected uh, light wavelength of the frequency would change. And then by, by, by from, from this change of wavelength, we can infer to it being either a strain change or a temperature change, a temperature change here, and then the strain changes here. So it's, there is a bunch of constants, strain, uh, strain optic coefficient, thermal expansion coefficient, thermal optic coefficient, but, but the gist of it is, is on this chart. So how does the fiber sensor work? Like I'm saying, it's like an accordion. You you kind of pitch and kind of uh, squeeze the 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 accordion. It, the 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 frequency of the sound changes. Same thing as the brad grating. So let's see if I press my mouse. Okay. So you have a constant wavelength, and then if you expand it, you see the pitch actually increase. So you have the additional component. And then now you have your blue shift. And then if you if you compress the fiber, you have your red shift. And then um, so this this slide shows about a typical way. Uh, we call this a wavelength division multiplexing. You would have a broadband light source with a certain bandwidth, let's say usually uh, run uh, run 50 nanometers of uh, bandwidth on each of these. Uh, fiber sensor is a unique wavelength or unique frequency. Each of them is around um, around ten nanometers different. So, so you can probably, if you have enough space, you can put five fiber grading onto this one roll of fiber, and then on each of these grading will have a unique frequency, and then we we collect the unique frequency onto a uh, optical spectrum analyzer, it, 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 it can be a, a, a bulky device or it can be a CCD camera to, to, to shine onto the, this wavelength monitoring system. So uh, that's a typical um, fiber detection technology using uh, wavelength division multiplexing. Um, so, so the pros and the cons for, for, for this wavelength division multiplexing uh, system, the advantage is you can, each of the sensor can be kilometers away from the interrogator because uh, it, it only, it only measures the amplitude of the light, of the, the reflected light. It's a relative simple measurement. It's, uh, there's a lot of commercial company that sells uh, uh, fiber grading based on wavelength division multiplexing. Um, there are instances of company that actually sell, uh, uh, they can interrogate up to like four sensor that is up to um, megahertz. You can do megahertz. Um, the disadvantage is that you, you have to keep in mind each of where your fiber grading is relative to your structure. You have to kind of eyeball it 
because uh, you you have to know where it is. And then your sensor has a, like I said, has a unique wavelength. So if you want to tell the manufacturer, I want, I want 50 sensor, then then you only have that 50 nanometer of uh, bandwidth. Then 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 you have to keep in mind which 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 frequency is which uh, sensor. Now now this we we now go back to this aliasing effect. If you have a lot of gratings, you don't have enough uh, bandwidth. One, what if one grading is under uh, compression and one grading is under uh, expansion? So if if the instant that these two grading meet one another, you you start having this aliasing effect, which you don't know which grading is which. So 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 that's that's a big no no on 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 our sensing system. So so you have to kind of give them enough bandwidth for each of the grading, and that limits the amount of grading you can put onto a WDM uh, sensor unit so um so that's why um nasa developed a um, unique fpg interrogation technique is called ofdr optical frequency domain refractometry it's based on laser interferometry so so instead of using a broadband led light source we have to use a a, a unique single longitudinal mode laser and it involves signal processing because we are not just reading the wavelength, we actually have to do some sort of modulation. And, and then you need to use Fourier transfer or inverse Fourier transfer to, to back couple the, the signal that we want. And then and then the, the second unique part is we are using uh, a, a weak reflectivity grading, which, which each of the grading will have the same um, wavelength, which makes the, the manufacturing process easy for these sensing arrays. The sensing array you can see here is up to 40 foot. And, and each of the individual sensor has a unique weak uh, reflectivity like 0.05. So, 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 so the common question would be asked, why would you want to use OFDR? It seems complicated. You have to use the algorithm, you have to use this unique laser. And then you have to get this unique grading in order to do that. Um, so, so here is um, I'm trying to justify why we want to use this. Um, so, so next slide gonna show the advantage of OFDL for the WDM sensor. So, um, so this is the high spatial density that WDM sensor wouldn't be able to do because on on one fiber we can actually cascade over a thousand fiber back grading onto this same fiber and each fiber can be half inch apart and and this is a base th these are actual um measurement onto the the hatch of this uh composite crew module that 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 was uh test uh at langley back in 2011 and um you can see the the simulation for for fem model if if this uh, module is under uh, expansion, um, then you have these type of strain indication. Um, on the left side, this is the actual measurement while as while this crew module is under under uh, expansion, and, and you have these type of FEM data being shown in real time. And 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 that's invaluable for 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 structural health monitoring. So you would know the precise strain distribution on your whole either aircraft or spacecraft on on critical areas that 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 you would never be able to get with just point sensors alone. And then kind of go back to the the cost front. Why would you want to in, invest on on these? If if you're talking about a point sensor. Each each sensor for WDM is around two hundred dollars a pop, and then you have to custom make locations. For for OFDR, we are looking at around less than a dollar per grading. If you want to, if you want to do like a meters worth, it's, it's around sixty sixty dollars. So 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 the cost um, advantage pre sensor is is, is actually um, kind of dramatic. And then uh, this is the this is the fundamental behind uh, OFDR. 
um, I mentioned that all these grading are written on the same wavelength. So how would how would the how would be able to figure out which grading we're looking at? And and this is the the principle because we're using uh, some sort of uh, a modulation. We're we're actually using interferometry in order to tell each of the grading. We we tell each of the grading by the the location where where is at at the uh, in interference front. So each of the unique grading, even though they have the same frequency, they they I mean same wavelength. They they are indicated by the the length difference relative to where your beat frequency, where your source light is, and uh, I know there's a lot of equation here. So um, let me try to simplify this. So um, the next simplification is a flow flow chart. We have a tuning laser that tunes a certain wavelength, and then we perform this FFT. And then we do the inverse FFT. And then once we get that individual grading, we will look at the, the wavelength change, just like the WDM front. And then we will tell, tell you the sensor. That still seems complicated. So, so in layman's term, it's just basically tuning your radio station. So a radio station, you have multiple frequencies broadcast onto the airwave. And then we have a radio that receive all these different frequency, you know, 80, 89.5, all the way to 100, 106.5. We receive all these frequency in between. And then we actually ask our tuner to just look at that one frequency and then we'll listen to the information. Same thing here, the OFDR. So we have a tuning laser light that tunes all the different and each of these frequency is generated by the length difference from where we start uh, our measurement. And then we collect all, all these, each of these sensor will have a unique sensor ID and, and that determines the location of the sensor. And then, and then our, our interrogator basically is, is, is the photo detector receive all these unique frequency this is kind of like a inter, in, um, this is a, a interferometer, and then at the end we use our algorithm. The simplest one is the FFT Fourier domain, and then the inverse Fourier domain to get that individual grading. And then now we're going back to the wavelength domain, and then now we can use the the WDM method of doing a wavelength change in order to tell us the the strain or the temperature that we want to measure. So, um, so here done the theory part. Now we just kind of show what what a typical OFDR um, based fast fiber optic sensing system works in NASA. So usually we have this um, laboratory unit, and the laboratory unit it, it has a um, number of channels of output, and then we we put it an optical patch cable, and then this what we call a BBR box is a completely optical um, location to set up our interferometer. And, and then this is where our, 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 our zero point is. And then the lead cable kind of goes to, to, to this optical splice and then uh, a sensing fiber attached to the specimen. So, so, so this lead cable is around, usually around up to six foot. And then uh, sensing fiber is, is, is either usually will, 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 will measure something of 40 foot because uh, a wingspan of aircraft is usually 40 foot. So um, now this slide talk about our current FOSS capabilities. So uh, uh, we have a current uh, system specification depend on, on either a ground system or flight system or launch system. Each, it, 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 it depends on, on on the system characteristic, we have two or four or eight channels. Usually each channel we can do 40 foot of sensing fibers and each of the, um, so, so if you do your math, you have 40 foot and you do, um, you have eight channels, then you have 2000 sensors. Well, 2000 sensor, each of them being half inch apart 
than 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 that forty foot translate to two thousand sensor, as we reiterate, and then we use a single mode fiber, um, for flight max sample rate is around fifty hertz, uh, power, um, we do a twenty eight volt DC at four and a half amps, um, ground power is hundred ten, user interface um is Ethernet connection, to 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 your aerospace um, component. The the flight non non optimized system. This is like um, twelve years ago, that that was on Icona, which is twenty seven pound. The ground system. You can see these boxes here. These are the the earlier one, in probably two thousand twelve, two thousand thirteen. These are the the what we call a micro fast, which is um our, our latest ground based system. It's around seven pounds. And and then the launch system, here these are the launch system that we we support a NASA project. I'll show later. It's around thirty five pounds. Um, it's it's it needs to be regularized to in order to survive a, a space launch. And these are the size of these systems. Uh, the aircraft that we have support over the years is the. Is the 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 Predator B, which is what we are NASA called the Icona, uh, experimental aircraft called Global Observer, and then our G three with a, a a custom wing for um for uh for an application. Um. So so NASA's AFLC's role in fiber sensing technology. This technology has uh its first pioneer and patent in NASA Langley Research Center. Uh, during the late 90s, it was a laboratory based system. You can see the old computer with with the laser it's, it's a Rackman system and then and uh, everything is Rackman. You, you basically you press a button, you wait 30 seconds in order to do the algorithm. So and, and then we can only do one channel. So um, so what Armstrong has been doing is trying to miniaturize and develop this one box solution to put all the laser, all the optical component, all the signal processing into this one brain. So, so before we use uh, uh, CAT's um, uh, over-the-counter um, acquisition system, over-the-counter um, um, Intel-based processor to do the, the processing. And now, now we, we actually have our own Pattern of um of an improved um, Fourier transform technique. We 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 look at FPGA to program the algorithm into into a FPGA processor in order to to speed up the the uh, the the um the uh, algorithm to speed up the process and 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 hence that's the the patents and and then we we've done a lot of tests. Uh, for NASA to support various projects to to make sure that this is optimized either through miniaturization or through or or or, or through regularization to make it either smaller or beefier, depending on the customers. And so so the next step is okay, you got this one box interrogation solution, but what can you measure? So, so our fuel operation, I, I kind of uh, mentioned the strain. Um, also, inside a rocket, you, you, you want to measure the temperature, either the cryogenic or, or, or the heat shield. And then uh, from strain, you can actually defer shape for, 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 for the strain monitoring. And then you can, you can kind of do some calculation of 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 like pressure while the COPV um is expanding, you can kind of calculate the, the, the pressure being exerted. So, so there's a uh, the 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 actual measurement is is wavelength, and that that's that's direct correlated to strain, either strain or temperature. But then the other parameters with this calculated result. So um. So I, I I did mention this composite crew module. So four fiber were installed onto the modules, three windows and one hatch. Um, real time um, strain distribution uh, across the the hatch. You can kind of see the zero strain while it's under 
200 percent um, device under low pressurization testing and the, the fiber measured data across the inner hatch under mass pressure it's um that the, the fiber actually uh, measure the result it's um um closely related to the predicted result. So, so the, the project conclusion is that fiber optic real-time monitor test against analytical prediction was essential in the success of the full-scale test model. Uh, in areas high strain gradient, these techniques were invaluable. So, so you, if us, uh, us design a next generation aircraft, it seems that well, nothing beats uh, real-time testing. So you, you, if you have these testing results that can reiterate of your design that would be invaluable for your for for your design algorithm and and that's one of the strength for for OFDR based uh, ground testing. And then this is a cryogenic liquid level sensing. Um, so in terms of cryogen, the the fiber would be able to 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 sustain measure uh, uh, um, cryogenic temperature and cryogenic liquid level. Uh, in terms of liquid level, we have a, a pattern um, talking about if you have um, usually on a steady state liquid on a cryogen, it's hard to distinguish between the Eulish level, which is the gaseous phase, and the liquid that you 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 want you have contained onto it, um, because the temperature is is on the Eulish is 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 really close to the liquid temperature, so it's it's by using temperature is kind of hard to measure. So we have a technique that we embed uh, a heating element co-located to the fiber. So while you heat the 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 eulage because of the thermal conductivity difference between the eulage and the, the liquid, we can generate a different temperature profile between heating and cooling. Uh, then we can we, we have this high spatial density of a half inch interval then we can measure the liquid level. Uh, we have done tests and, and, and then to prove out that, that, that we can measure the liquid level. And then um, um, the latest um, work that, that we have done is uh, we, we actually can do a passive sensor, which we uh, lay a, a, a PTFE sleeve onto the fiber. And at using that passive technique, we are able to measure temperature difference on the cryogenic liquid down to um, down to um, sub Kelvin scale plus or minus 0.75 um, Kelvin for so so we can use that also to measure um, liquid level or, or temperature across the tank. Um, so, so these are example of flight validation and also uh, example of 2D shape sensing on our Icona. Um, Icona was a um, pair of the B aircraft where we put uh, strain gauges and fiber strain gauge and, and, and normal uh, eight, uh, 16 um, resistors strain gauges for um, sensor validation. Um, see, I'm trying to speed this up. So basically, um, we can install the fiber. What happens is we have this wing, and then we we kind of uh, scrape off the paint, and then we put the fiber onto on onto the wing skin, and then we 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 have epoxy to to the same type of epoxy that you put on the, on your resistive string gauge, and then we paint over, and then we put epoxy over, make sure that the the the, the fiber is robust enough, um, and um, so we did that. We did the strain. It did, did the Icona test. Um, it, it flew, and and we we have good result. So so here is the co-locating strain gauges, and here is the the. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight strain gauge data, and now you have these so many different data onto the fiber in terms of strain, and and we will ask how come there is kind of these spot that's that's kind of high and these spot kind of lowest we we can actually see where the spars is, is located across the wing of the aircraft so you you have this higher level of of strain distribution that that you 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 can never get for for point sensor so so that's also invaluable and and because we have these so much data 
now we can do algorithm to do 2D shape sensing. So this is the structural strain because we know the structure of the Icana aircraft. We can know the that we can actually measure this wingtip deflection. You can see that these are the strain data. And then from the strain data, you you know the geometry of the aircraft. Now you can you 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 can calculate the, the wing shape deflection while the, the pilot is doing uh, different turns onto aircraft then you can you can see this deflection in terms of inches of while the, the wing is bending. So this is another pattern that we have in terms of 2D shape. And because of time, we have other um, NASA related front, but, but this is one of the um, stuff that we work on and we're so proud of our team. As, uh, this is the FOSS project. We are part of the lofted uh, low earth orbit flight test of an uh, inflatable decelerator. So um, this is the launch version of the FOSS that we have been developed um, over the last five years. And it's in the, the system is integrated into the FOSS um, into the lofted to monitor the nose cone temperature during the re-entry. And we we did all the, the 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 environmental testing. We 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 did the EMI. We did the burning. We did the thermal vacuum testing. We did the the shock testing, and make sure that there's up to snuff for a rocket launch and and a reentry. And we, lo and behold, this 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 project launch on um, last month. And and here's a short video kind of talking about the result on this launch. Live from the central coast of California, this is NASA's JPSS-2 and Lofted, which will demonstrate a new type of heat shield that inflates for atmospheric re-entry. So um so so that was the lofted launch and um we we after the launch there's a there is a video saying that they recovered the data recorder and uh after we we um look at the data recording data kind of uh we value uh we validate that the FOSS system was operational during the descent and we collected some interesting data that we will share to lofted. And 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 basically, it it call, uh, it it, it represents that the FOSS system were able to to withstand a rocket launch and and was operational during the the reentry phase and the the temperature data um, collected was uh, was interesting to say the least. Live from. All right. In summary, so NASA has successfully deployed FOSS. Uh, laboratory and real world application and um, commerce commercialization technology is ongoing via NASA tech transfer. Um, there's you know aerospace, there might be energy sector, there might be biomedical application. There's a lot of um, different application beyond uh, what NASA is doing, and that's what NASA is good at. We 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 we're good at developing technology for for the space or aerospace, and then tech transfer will take over, and then translate the technology into um, everyday life. So um, 
with that, I um, appreciate your attention and thank you for um, listening to my talk.